Hello and welcome to Baseball Barbacast, the only baseball podcast in the world for whom every regional is a super regional because I'm super. I'm Jake Mintz and I am not joined by Jordan Schusterman because he's still moving. He's taking his time. Instead, I'm joined by the woman who puts the pro in WAPO, a Long Meadow Lancer legend, the Garrett Stubbs of Ivy League softball, one career triple, someone who I'm humbled to call a contemporary, proud to call a friend. One of the few people on planet Earth who might like baseball more than I do. She played for the 18 and under Massachusetts Destruction Club <laughs> team and was an all-state tenor saxophone player and first chair in the all-Western Massachusetts Wind Ensemble, the national baseball writer for the Washington Post. Chelsea Janes, hello and good morning. Good morning. Wow, that was more than I expected to hear about myself at this hour, but thank you. Yeah. The internet is a is a beautiful place place Chelsea and before we get into it I want to know about your one career triple as a softball player at Yale you know it's actually if it's what I'm remembering and there weren't many to mix it up with so it was like one of the first games my dad had not attended um I was very lucky to have him at every game and I hit a 3-1 pitch up the right field line and I, you know, it was like on GameCast, my dad was following it and he saw that I was like, had an extra base hit and texted my mom. And he's like, I think GameCast is broken. Like oh. she got a hit. And my mom was like, no, it's real. <laughs> and I like got to second base. I was like holding my batting gloves. They were like, no, you got to like, or third base. And they were like, you got to put those in your pocket. I was like, I sorry. I've just like never been here before. I don't know what the rules. <laughs> So it's my was, first time. It's my first time this close to home plate. Yes. Uh, did was I correct to describe your your playing style? You were a, d a defense first catcher, correct? Yeah, yeah. The Garrett Stubbs of yeah. I mean, perfect, generous. Yeah. How does your history as a catcher influence your uh, baseball watching talents now as a professional baseball watcher? It's a great question. I've always really appreciated the backup catchers of the world, so that's part of it. I think I really root for them and I I am always very happy when I see them, you know, come up with a big hit or something. But other than that, I don't know that I learned a whole lot that helps me sort of think think along with major league baseball catchers because we just didn't have the we didn't have the arsenals in, in our pitching staff to really get too creative. We were kind of just like, please go over the plate. So please throw it over the plate. Yeah. You weren't weren't <laughs> leaning on the rise ball no. all too much. No. Uh, on today's episode, we are going to not talk about Ivy League softball much longer. I am going to shout out Ivy League baseball because this is regional weekend for Division One college baseball. Very exciting. The Ivy League champ. Penn Quakers will be in Charlottesville, Virginia as the four seed. Um, but we're going to focus on, for the first chunk of our show, the Jorge Lopez debacle slash kerfuffle that happened on Wednesday night in Queens. Uh, we will both tell our perspectives uh, on the story. I barely missed it in person. I'll explain why. We're going to talk to Chelsea about the Nationals and the Orioles, the two teams within driving distance. Although I guess everything is within driving distance if you have the stamina. We'll think about Clark Schmidt's injury. We'll talk about the Blue Jays City Connects, and then we will get out of here with the good, the bad, and the ugly. But let's begin in Queens, New York, where the, the ever calamitous Mets, the eternal disaster, the blue and orange landslide continued. They, they stayed true to themselves. The... Uh, I'm sure there are some people who don't know what happened. So I'm just going to quickly run through the beat by beat of the Jorge Lopez situation. First thing to know, who is Jorge Lopez, right? Jorge Lopez is a mediocre starter on the Kansas City Royals. And then he is a bad starter on the Baltimore Orioles in 2021. They move him to the bullpen. And what do you know? He's throwing harder. Incredible in 2022. He's an all-star, one of the best closers in the sport. They trade him to Minnesota at the deadline for a package in 22 that includes Yenny A. Cano, who is now the best reliever in the Orioles bullpen. He's bad for Minnesota in 22, bad for them in 23. They cut him. He ends up with the Marlins. He's bad for them. They cut him. He ends up with the Orioles. He's still bad for them. Mets signed him into a one-year, $2 million deal this past offseason. A couple other points of context that are important to know about Jorge Lopez. He's had some mental health issues in the past, including a 15-day IL stint last year when he was with the Twins. He has a kid named Michael who has a very rare illness that requires like a ton of maintenance. 
when Jorge was in Baltimore, it was a thing the team rallied around uh, quite often. And then, you know, this year up until this week, I was like a perfectly solid workhorse reliever for the Mets just coming in out of the bullpen. Chelsea, did you have any overlap with him when you were around the Orioles at all? I know you probably weren't like as frequent a presence on the 2022 Orioles as you are nowadays. Um, but I'm curious if you had any direct interactions with Jorge Lopez. I don't think anything other than a few quick, like one-on-one -on -one interviews about teammates, but he was super, super nice. Absolutely no red flags that I saw, you know, nothing, nothing that stuck out in a bad way or a good way, frankly. Yeah. Okay. So what happened this week? So Jorge Lopez does something incredibly normal and that is allow a home run to Shohei Otani. Okay. I've done it. You've done it. <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> We've all been there. And that is, you know, I'm not going to have too many other jokes here. I will say, allowing the homer to Otani being the thing that really set him off is like, dude, it's okay. Like, if if, if it had been David Fletcher or Andrew Benintendi or some, you know, Luisa Rise, then, you know, throw your glove. But, you know, we've all allowed a home run to Otani. There's no shame in that. So he allows a home run to Otani in what is eventually the Mets' eighth loss in nine games. On the very next pitch after the homer, Freddie Freeman checks swing. He doesn't go. Not really even that close. Lopez screams at the third base umpire, uh, Ramon De Jesus, who ejects him after some back and forth. On the way off the field, Lopez throws his glove over the 20-foot netting. Heck of a throw. Best throw of the day. Throws his glove over the netting into the crowd. Walks off the field. Bad look. Right? Not something that you want to do. It's uh, That's the type of thing where, like, if one of my Little League kids did it, I would... Be like, you can't do that. I can't DFA a 10-year-old, but, you know, I would definitely bench them, at least for a second. Okay, so in the post-game scrum, when he's asked about it, we get a hurricane of miscommunication, where for a moment, it sounds like Lopez is saying he's the worst, he's on the worst effing team in baseball. It was later kind of confirmed that he definitely said the worst effing teammate in baseball. He's being really self-critical. He looks really frazzled. It was... Pretty obvious that this was a person who was not okay in the moment. The team then DFAs him. They cut him. They designate him for assignment. And then we get a statement from Lopez yesterday kind of reviewing the entire situation. So, Chelsea Janes, when you first saw this whole thing, what came to your mind? Yeah, I first saw the clip that SMY tweeted that said, like, he said he's on the worst, you know, effing team in MLB. And I was like, holy moly, like, wh what? And then I watched it and I was like, uh, like, you know, actually I did it in the wrong order because I retweeted it and then I watched it, which is on me. Um, but then I, I was watching it and I was like, oh my gosh, that's wild. But like, he wasn't in a rant. He was just kind of demoralized. I couldn't really hear him, but I assumed like, you know, they're saying that's what he said. That's probably what he said. Um, and then just kind of following along, it was like, it was just a really confusing situation because it felt like he was being conveyed as very angry in that scrum and he didn't look it right so it, it just was like kind of a strange interaction it felt like there was more angst built up there behind the scenes than like I was aware of not being there but um yeah in in the clarification was I think also confusing because I, there were a lot of the Mets beat writers trying to get it right who were like okay we checked with him we asked like did you mean this and he was like yeah whatever I meant that and it was like well it's kind of an important thing. You don't really, yeah, whatever that. So it just, it just felt like everyone was misunderstanding everyone and he probably didn't understand the stakes. And I don't know, not being there, it was, yeah. it was a very confusing thing to watch. So I will just say now, I was there when he threw the glove and then I left. I did not stay for post game clubhouse because I had concert tickets and I Fair. am a schmuck for this. And like, I, I wish I had stayed so I could have, you know, gotten to see and experience this. And, but I, and I, also missed I biffed that right I think the the key point for me is the Mets did not do enough in this moment to protect Lopez from himself and I think the reason that that happened and this is understandable is that he was dead weight already that the decision to cut him DFA him the, uh, whether that had happened before or after what he said, it was clearly being discussed. It was on the table after what he did on the field, right? And so what that means is 
the Mets were less incentivized to send someone in there to protect him. If this had been, theoretically, Edwin Diaz, who the Mets have under contract for you know a lot more years and a lot more money, who is a vital member of their future, I would think that this would have gone differently, right? I think that they would have been more encouraged to ensure that he did not say anything stupid or silly and that everything was conveyed clearly. I think that not having a translator did him a huge disservice. I, I, I'm I sympathetic to a point to the Mets PR staff because you can't go up to a player who does not want a translator and force an interpreter on that player. Think about that look. That's a bad look, right? It's a very difficult situation that required tact where in the middle of him jumbling through the response, someone should have been like, hey, Jorge, it seems like you're really struggling to kind of convey what you're feeling here. Let's bring in a translator just so we can get it right. That's the way the situation should have been handled. But in the moment, that's really difficult, right? And that is, it's all just very unfortunate and very sad. I'm confused too by just how quickly it seemed like he became persona non grata in that room. You know, I think that's like, sure, he threw the glove and it was a bad day, but I... Like, I'm confused about how quickly he was sort of left out to dry because, you know, seeing clips of teammates and stuff, there was no one sort of, it, it was, nobody kind of has gone in and been like, yeah, he got screwed, for lack of a better term. Like, it's just been a weird, weird situation. And you're right, like, you can't tell him use an interpreter, but what you can do is, like many, you know, you can listen in and realize something's wrong and, and try to fix it. And I, I just feel like everyone kind of failed him and... It's my worst nightmare personally to like misquote someone who didn't know what they were saying, basically. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I just kind of feel for him and I feel for everyone who like watched that happen and was not in a position to kind of like understand it yeah. fully. And yeah. I think that let, let's talk about just the conduct on the field, the glove throw. I think it's fair to call it a tantrum, an outburst, right? You paid witness to a similar situation in D.C., I believe 2018. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I, think I believe so. it was. I, I, I will check that. It was Davey at the time, though. Yes, so, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. A reliever on the Washington Nationals by the name of Sean Kelly is pitching uh, in a baseball game, as was his job. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes. August 1st, 2018. Uh, pitching with a 24-run lead. Okay, I'm just going to say that again. A 24-run lead against the Mets. The the Nationals, these were, these were the Nationals. The Nationals are up 25-1 to 1 over the New York Mets. And Sean Kelly allows a two-run home run to, I believe that is Austin Jackson on the Mets. That is hilarious. And... He is pulled from the game because he slams like Gronk spikes his glove on the mound after allowing the homer and turns towards the dugout. Now, allowing a home run in a 25 to 2 game and throwing your glove on the ground like that's childish. He is then removed from the proceedings and DFA'd shortly thereafter. What do you remember from the Sean Kelly situation? So much. Um, I think the <laughs> context there was that, like, you know, Sean Kelly was a veteran reliever. I think at that point he was in the third year of a three-year deal with the Nats. And I'm pretty sure he had been giving up just, like, a ton of homers. And so I think he was mad he was in the game. Like, I think he had turned off his brain for the day and thought, like, throw a kid in there. Like, I shouldn't be there. I think they were out of arms or trying to get him some work. And he was mad he was in the game. And then he watches, you know, his ERA go up and he spikes the glove. And... My understanding of what happened after that, and, you know, Sean Kelly's a really good-natured guy. Like, he probably laughs about this now, to be honest. Um, I think he went in the clubhouse, and there was, like, a confrontation with Mike Rizzo uh, that had to be broken up. Because, you know, like, I, and my understanding, too, is, like, Sean Kelly pretty quickly was like, yeah, that wasn't cool. But, uh, yeah, it was kind of, like, a very heated moment in a season that was falling apart, and... Uh, but again, like there was context there. Like he didn't want to be in the game. He thought he was being disrespected. He's a veteran. It's 25 to one. So like the glove slam was childish and a tantrum, but it like made sense. Um, it, and it wasn't like they didn't DFA him just because he did 
that they DFA'd him because of how he handled the situation both before and after the fact, right? If he doesn't get into it with Mike Rizzo in the clubhouse, he probably doesn't get cut. And I think we have a similar situation here. Based upon my understanding in regards to Jorge Lopez is that the final decision to cut him was not made until after he spoke to reporters. Now, the Mets have been very ho-hum about this. Uh, Carlos Mendoza, their manager yesterday during his presser, was like, I'm giving you, he basically said, I'm not giving you guys a iota of timeline here, okay? Yeah. But my understanding, based upon people I've talked to, is that while it was being discussed before Lopez spoke to reporters, the final decision did not come until after, right? And so that tells me that when they talk about his conduct, it is both how he treated it, how he treated the team and the whole situation on the field, and how he acted afterwards, which I think is a little bit unfair. There was a situation, I believe, two years ago where Bryce Harper was ejected at home at Citizens Bank and threw his helmet into the crowd to a fan and a kid caught it. And the response to that moment was, oh, that's so cute. Bryce Harper's the best. And I do think that the way that we're talking about these two different scenarios is really interesting, right? Where we have a no-name reliever for a team that is like falling apart, is disintegrating at the seams. And he becomes the villain. I think Lopez is really here just in the wrong place at the wrong time, speaking the wrong first language. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, the word scapegoat sort of comes to mind. Um, and I think, too, like the Mets, you know, it's a different era, but only barely like when their players were booing their fans. I mean, like, what are we talking about? You know, it's it's not like <laughs> I don't know. They've seen worse. So the whole thing is kind of just a right. little bit. It's surprising. It feels like it escalated much more quickly than it needed to. And I'm just sort of stunned that the the lack of people in the Mets clubhouse offering any kind of yeah. de-escalation. Like, it's weird. Yeah. I, Disha Thosa, our friend of the program, former colleague of mine, put it really well to me yesterday when we were talking about it. She's like, like the Mets, when the Mets try to be a serious organization and where they're really intent on not metsing themselves is when they Mets the most. Yeah. <laughs> Such good right? call. Like, they can't get out of their own way. And I think we saw that a little bit yesterday. I think the last point here is just I'm glad that the discussion on this has changed somewhat. And I think that it's really easy to see the video and to see the clip of him saying I'm the worst player on the worst team or whatever. Right. And turn this guy into a punching bag and, and a punchline. I mean, this is someone who is not having a, a good time. This is someone who in that moment was not healthy. You know, and I think that specifically his own situation where he has a sick kid and yesterday was the sick kid's birthday, which makes this even more sour. And this is someone with a history of mental health issues. I just hope that people continue to give him some grace. I know that if I was in this type of situation, that's what I would want. Understanding, empathy, and not ridicule. I am pretty hopeful based upon how he threw for the Mets that he will get picked up somewhere else and throw again in the major leagues this year or another year. Um, but this whole thing just makes me feel sad. You yes. know, I just think it's just a bummer and it's as simple as that. Any final thoughts on this, Chelsea, before we move on to happier days? No, totally agree. Hope he pitches again. I don't think anything he did would scare teams off or should scare teams off. And when we talk about the spectrum of immorality, people, okay, there are way worse people throwing baseballs way more often than Mr. Jorge Lopez. Although, actually, you know what? Not more often. You know how much they were pitching this guy? (laughs) (laughs) This guy was throwing every day. That's why he had to underhand the glove. Yeah. (laughs) yeah, He was sore, right? You know, softball pitching, you throw it underhand, you don't get sore. You just keep going. On the broadcast yesterday, they were like, well, we got to find someone to replace all these Jorge Lopez innings. It's like, actually, yes. Yes, you do. You absolutely do. Good luck. Uh, All right. Let's drive down I-95 and towards where Chelsea Janes lives. I won't, you know, dox your specific address, but you are in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, and that means you spend quite a bit of time around the Nats and the O's. This season has belonged to the O's more than the Nats. The Orioles are one of the best teams in the league. However, I would say it is about as optimistic things have been down at Nats Park since 2019. So let's begin with them. What has gone well? For the Washington Nationals in 2024 to 
this point? I think the easiest way to explain it is that Sean Doolittle was added to their coaching staff and has... Great. All right. Wrap it up. That's yep. all we got to know. <laughs> yep. I, I mean, really, though, I mean, for years, I mean, since 2014 or before, they just were never able to turn young pitchers with potential into actual big league starters. And the ones they did were like Steven Strasburg, you know, and you, it would be hard to not. So we could have done that. Right. Yeah, exactly. And so I think what's happened this year that's made everyone so hopeful is that not only is a guy like Mackenzie Gore, who you want to be the next ace of the Nationals, turning into that guy, but some, frankly, randos are, are turning into real big league pitchers. I mean, Jake Irvin is a guy who, you know, they thought I think could maybe help, but certainly wasn't penciled in as a four or five long term and now looks like he might be that. Um, Mitchell Parker, I don't know if it's going to last, but he's been really, really good over and over. A lefty who I think Doolittle's probably had a big effect on. I mean, basically they're just making pitchers better and that's not something they've ever done. And from what I hear, a large part of that is Sean Doolittle and his kind of, uh, what he described to me as like inability to sleep if he hasn't figured out some guy's problem. Um, so, I don't know if that's good for his long-term health, but it's it's great for the Nats, and there's a lot of, of promising stuff happening there. Mix in a nap, Sean. Uh, do you remember a character from Even Stevens named of Beans? Of course. Mitchell Parker. Wow, yes. Looks not exactly like Beans, but not not like Beans. And I asked around about this to the Nats, Chelsea, and apparently... Some of his teammates have been calling him Beans since spring training. I did. Oh my gosh. I didn't know that. That's an incredible fact. And it's spot on as soon as you said it. Yeah. He's like hotter Beans is yes. the way I would describe Mitchell Parker. Because comparing someone to Beans is, is not kind. But Mitchell Parker, yeah, he's been amazing. My favorite thing when you look at the national starters so far this year, right? You have irrationally excellent Trevor Williams, who was spectacular again last night against the Braves. Like, Sure. And Jake Irvin's been very good. Mackenzie Gore as an ERA under three. Mitchell Parker came up and has been solid. But Patrick Corbin, tough day for him yesterday. 30, oh, and 34. Yeah. Patrick Corbin has a 6 1 2 ERA. Still, yeah. it, he is unfixable. He has been so available for the Nationals yes. during his disastrous tenure. So just let's do a little context here for people. Patrick Corbin. Signs a contract with the Nats in 2019 for seven years, six years, six years, six years, 140 something million dollars, more than more than we both have in our piggy banks. Um, yeah. And he's spectacular in year one and finishes 11th in the Cy Young and helps the Nats win the World Series, like legitimate postseason hero for the Nationals. OK. And then everything falls apart since 2020. Patrick Corbin has started 116 games for the Washington Nationals. He has thrown 630 innings. That is workhorse behavior. And he has an ERA of 567. So let me ask a very simple question. What happened and why hasn't anything changed in the last five years with Patrick Corbin? I think two things happened. I think everyone the Nats leaned on in that run broke. I and mean, nobody was the mm. same after that. And he, I think, probably had lost a little life on everything and needed every ounce of life he had because his mix is not, you know, that vast. I also think he's predictable and he's had trouble developing anything to go with the the slider, fastball, everything. Like, he he's tried to use a cutter this year. It has not changed anything. Um, there's been times where, like, the changeup has been something. It just hasn't clicked. And, you know, I don't... I think the Nationals have a lot of respect for him because he has just kind of worn this. But they're getting to a point now where Josiah Gray is going to be coming back uh, from injury, and they're going to have to decide whether a couple more months of Patrick Corbin is, like, something they're willing to wear or not. Like, th the decision is coming. So, like, the Patrick Corbin legacy discussion, which might be brief, uh, is, is underway because, like, he might, it might be time. If Patrick Corbin slips on a banana peel <laughs> at the 2019 World Series parade and lands on his elbow, and doesn't throw another pitch for the Nationals, he might have his jersey retired legitimately. I mean, go back and look at the game log from 2019. This guy was vital, yes. vital for that team. They do not win the World Series without Patrick Corbin, right? Totally. 
it was it's you know the dumb batman quote you live long enough to see yourself become the villain that's exact but it happened right away too right yeah. it, it was bad immediately and i think that it is fascinating what the Nats are going to do when he gets back because if you send down Mitchell Parker, you can't send Mitchell Parker back down. He's been so good. And, yeah. and, and I I am fascinated just to see what they do here. Uh, last question about the Nationals. What does a successful season look like for them? Because as fun as this has been, as successful as things have gone, they've had some unbelievably fun performances from Jacob Young, who does everything but hit, but hits enough to be very valuable. We've seen a lot of good things from C.J. Abrams. Jesse Winker has a 121, sure, OPS plus. If I don't think either of us believe they're going to make the playoffs. Is that fair? Do you agree? Totally. Okay, so then what does a good rest of the season look like? Does it involve them trading these pieces that have overperformed and are maybe going to reach free agency at the end of the year? Does it look like them adding at the deadline and maybe giving fans a reason to care in the second half of the season? What does success look like? I think for them... And I, and I think that's like an open question because I think they're kind of caught in this place where like, if we're around 500, you kind of got to try, but Trevor Williams could get you something. I mean, I don't know if, if Winker and Rosario and guys like that'll get you much more than a lottery ticket, but Hey, that's, that's something. But I think for them, they need to get to a place by the end of this year where they know what they have and they know what they need to contend next year. So if you can get through this year and you believe in the starting rotation and you've called up James Wood and you see him there in August and September, you can go out in the free agent market and try to get yourself, take the next step and finally kind of get out of rebuild mode. I think that's where they need to be. And, you know, I don't expect them to add at the deadline, certainly. I think they would be probably a little bit negligent not to subtract. But, you know, if they're around 500, I don't know what you do, but... But yeah, I think you need to get to a place where this offseason you go into it, you say, okay, let's turn into somebody that can compete. And right. yeah. It, I couldn't foresee a scenario where Mike Grizz was like, Broncos Nation, let's ride. Like, let's, you know, let's let's push the pedal to the metal at the deadline. But probably doesn't make too much sense. And you mentioned a lottery ticket. You know, sometimes those lottery tickets turn into O'Neill Cruz. That was a lottery oh. ticket for Tony Watson, I believe at the deadline and Jordan Alvarez was a lottery ticket for Josh Fields. Right. And so there are moments where it is worth it to trade these guys because sometimes it works out. Dylan Floro on the nationals right now has a 0.96 ERA and 28 innings. He is a free agent at the end of the year. He is 33. The nationals should trade that guy for some, you know, six foot five high school kid or Venezuelan shortstop who's in the DSL. That is good business. It makes sense. That's a good job of running a baseball team. Um, we talk about the Orioles enough on this pod, but let's talk about them very briefly. You have been making the drive up uh, the Baltimore Washington Parkway more often this year to see the baby birds. What have you enjoyed the most? There are a lot of good things happening in Birdland, but for you as someone who's you know around the team much more regularly th regularly than I am, what has what has like stuck with you? when you drive home from Camden Yards? I think I find it remarkable how good those guys are when they get to the big leagues and how, you know, Jackson Holiday being the exception, but just how ready they are for sort of the whole thing. Like, you know, Kowser, Westberg, I mean, obviously Adley and Gunner, but like, there's no, there's not only no fear, there's sort of just like no angst. It's like a very different clubhouse than any I've ever experienced because number one, I think all those guys came up together and genuinely are friends. And I think in other rooms, the amount of shuttling back and forth to AAA, the amount of competition over spots, like could really cause some issues and it just hasn't. They just seem to handle those conversations very well in that organization. And I think that for me is the thing I'm impressed with because I mean, even going to like Jorge Mateo and Urias and all these guys who, you know, have kind of had one foot out the door since the young guys started coming up, they're still performing. They still find it bats for them. You know, they they just kind of seem to manage the people very well there right now. And I don't know if it's because the guys in the clubhouse are particularly good. I don't know if the way that, you know, the organization is is handling it is good. But I've just been really impressed with how everybody handles everything and just doesn't other than that series against texas i have never seen that room flustered and i i don't expect to it's like where's the strife right, right. where's the agenda right. what like 
in a lot of rooms, someone like Kyle Stowers, who has been up and down between AAA and the big leagues and who has crushed it in AAA, would be frustrated that he's not getting playing time. And maybe Kyle Stowers is frustrated you know, underneath the surface, but not allowing that to detract from what's going on in the room is a pretty impressive dynamic yes. that they've been able to foster. And I also think it's interesting within the context of who Mike Elias is and where he comes from, because in Houston, that was a real critique of that room was at times the Astros organization was criticized for not always treating the people like people. Right. And it appears to me whether this is Elias's call or whether it's random chance, he has in some ways learned from that experience and has made that a priority in Baltimore, at least to this point. Right. Again, or at least as the result, we can't it's harder for us from the outside to just understand whether that is a priority or they just got lucky with Colton Kowser liking Legos. Right. right? I mean, that's right. It, right. who knows. But the result is positive uh, for the Orioles. Yes. Let me ask you the same question I asked about the Nats. Like, what does a, su- a successful Orioles season look like? I think I think you got to get to the, the CS. I think at least show that you can move forward. But, you know, I don't know. They're in, a, they're in kind of an interesting spot. I think they also probably need to make a couple really good deadline deals and start to weed out some of these extra bodies they have. That, I think, is going to be really important because you can't do this forever. So I think getting their roster in a little bit of a more manageable spot and and making the most of who they have is going to be is going to be important. You mentioned the room after the Texas series. It it was fascinating so you know they had not gotten swept in 85 years up until the Rangers took all three games in the ALDS. And it the lights just seemed so bright. Yeah. I was not at any of those games because you know I was busy winning the NLDS against the Braves. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but, um, but I'm curious for you as someone who is a- around that, like what about that moment got too big for the Orioles? Pitching. They just weren't ready. I mean, I think Grayson Rodriguez is ready now. I don't think he was then. Bradish was fine, but I just, the pitching, it, they needed an ace. They needed someone who could set a tone. And they just ran into something they weren't ready for. But I, I don't think that'll happen again. I think they're short on pitching, but like I think those guys understand now. But it was uh I think they just went they didn't have enough. They didn't have enough arms. All right, that's enough. That's enough beltway sludge. Let's drain the swamp and take a break. And when we get back, we will talk about the Blue Jay City Connects, Clark Schmidt, and do the good, the bad, and the ugly. And welcome back to Baseball Barbecast, Jake Mintz and not Jordan Schusterman. I'm joined by Chelsea Janes of the Washington Post. We'll do the good, the bad, and the ugly in a second, but let's talk about the New York Yankees, the only baseball team that actually matters. Eh, Dodgers too. Uh, Clark Schmidt is going to go on the IL. I believe he was already put on the IL. He is not going to throw a baseball for four to six weeks. The Yankees' rotation to this point in the season has been absolutely phenomenal. Garrett Cole, who has been hurt since spring training, they really haven't missed a step. They've gotten great starts from Schmidt, Carlos Rodon, Nestor Cortez, um, Luis Heal, and Mark Stroman. They've been probably the second best starting rotation in baseball behind the Phillies. But now we have Clark Schmidt hitting the shelf with a lat strain. Let me ask a very stupid question. Does this change the way, meaningfully change the way we are thinking about the Yankees moving forward during the regular season? For me, yes, only because one injury, as soon as you get one more, you're starting to look short. Uh, that's just my pitching paranoia, I think. But you also don't necessarily know what you're going to get from Garrett Cole. I mean, it's a pretty safe bet that you'll get Garrett Cole. But I think it I think it matters. I think any time you take somebody who's been that good out, uh, it matters. But I don't know. I still think they're in pretty good shape. And if they need something, they can get it. I always, yeah, that's a, that's a great point because the Yankees have been willing to go get people at the deadline every year, particularly starting pitching, whether it's Jay Happ or Lance Lynn or, you know, Frankie Montas. Like it, they don't always work, but they will go get bodies to fill in. And so if they do think they need to do that, that's something Brian Cashman is going to do. Um, I think this is adorable. You know, Garrett Cole and Clark Schmidt, Clark Schmidt's little brother, Garrett Cole's big brother. And, you know, now, now they get to hang out on the IL together. It's a bummer for Schmidt, though, who's just been so good this year, who's you know, really taking some slow steps forward. It is hard as a homegrown player to break into Yankee world because the standards for being an everyday guy there are so high. And we've seen this happen with so many 
prospects who come up, whether it's on the pitching side or or not, that can't stick for the Yankees. They have a reputation for developing pitching at the minor leagues, and very few of those guys have become starters so far. And that's in part because they're getting traded away at the deadline for pieces that are helping them, or they're getting moved to the bullpen and they're being impact guys there, like Ron Marinaccio or Michael King was another good example. That was a big win. But to see someone like Schmidt make that leap into the rotation has been very impressive. Bummer for him. Hopefully he gets back healthy soon. One more topic before the good, the bad, and the ugly. The Toronto Blue Jays dropped their City Connect uniforms, I believe, last night. Leaving us, I think there's just one team left that we're missing this year, and that is the Minnesota Twins. That will then give 28 of the 30 teams a City Connect uniform, with the Yankees and the A's as the only two teams who don't have one, which is so good. The Yankees will never do it because they've got, you know, the stick of history up their ass, and the A's won't do it because they're literally disconnecting from their city. <laughs> but the <laughs> we got these Blue Jays unis. Uh, they're going with the motif. They're calling them night mode, which is awesome. It sounds like something Michael Scott would say in the office when he like turns all the lights off in, in the room. Uh, what was your takeaway from the uh, Blue Jays City Connect uniforms? I, I think it's probably very difficult to design a baseball jersey. Okay. I do not think it is as difficult as everyone has made it look this year and as they have been making these. I, I don't think the answer is just to put a gray or black jersey on. I I just, you had the entire country of Canada. You know, I'm sure there are restraints I don't know about. I'm sure there, I just think, I think you guys should do it. I just think there are better options than turning something into night mode. I love night mode. My phones are all on dark mode, but I, I think we can do better. I just think we have to. So I agree with you. I think the problem now is that every City Connect that comes out that is night mode, that is dark, that is black tops, navy tops, black bottoms, navy bottoms, they stand out less because they, they're starting to all look the same. I think if we get these particular unis, these Blue Jays night mode unis, two years ago, I like them a lot more in my brain because I haven't seen this 10 other times. I think the rollout was freaking cool. They had Jose Bautista in the city. They got Edwin Encarnacion up there. They got um, a, the re really cool like release video, like when they dropped it. I, I like the look of the skyline. I don't think we've gotten enough skylines in City Connect. I like the hats. However, you're right. Enough night mode. Someone turn on the lights, please. Like the Angels one, crisp, right? Totally. We got some bright, like it's bright colors and it's dark together. Yeah, yeah. The mo I, I'm just, I'm out on them. I, I don't, I think the Cherry Blossom ones really spoiled me because those are like the best jerseys a DC sports team has had in years. But I just think we can be, I think we can do more. Be better. Hmm. Be better, everybody. Be better, Nike. Be better. With Nike. all due respect. But yes. <laughs> Incredible way to go with all due respect by saying, this is hard. You're making it look too hard. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Let's hop in to the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, Chelsea Janes, I will kick you the rock. What was good for you this week in the world of baseball? You know, I kind of already talked about it, but I'm just, I think, I think if we will look back and think that, uh, that Sean Doolittle changed the trajectory of the Washington Nationals. And I know that sounds extremely dramatic, but, uh, He's been, he's really, I mean, I thought by now, by June, they would have fallen off completely. They haven't, you know, they're just, the pitching staff looks better. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a hometown focused person right now, but I, you know, I just think like people might not realize that that's been a huge transformation there. That's an organization that like had no ability to make anybody better. And Sean Doolittle showed up and they're getting better. And I think it's, it's fun to see him in the dugout. And I, I hope he can, gets his due for that. Well, and Remember, we were dunking on this team in spring training for I don't care how hard you throw a ball for, right? This is not something that is going on for that long. They have not been... He is single-handedly, in some ways, making them competent at the big league level in terms of pitching development. I hope that he, that kind of trickles down. Totally. Right? That he's able to kind of create that so that pitchers who are in the in the system are benefiting from it. I mean, you know, look at Eric Fetty, who was a first-round pick who got out of the Nationals organization and suddenly got a lot better. Right. I yes. think that is a trend and there's a reason for something like that. He also credits Doolittle, though, with the fix. There you go. Uh, my good this week. 
One thing I did like, I'm just going to briefly touch on, uh, Wayne Gretzky showing up to Truist Park at a Braves game and wearing the 99 Spencer Strider uniform is great feel. But instead, I'm going to talk about David Fletcher. David Fletcher, who is just having a time. He is the only other big leaguer who has been wrapped up in the Ipe Shohei Otani gambling ring scandal. He's currently under investigation over gambling allegations. He is also in AAA with the Braves right now. But he's pitching. So David Fletcher, who is the prototypical, doesn't hit the ball hard, slap it and run middle infielder who can't really play shortstop. Kind of a tough profile in the year of our Lord 2024. He's a triple A with the Braves as like a depth piece who can't get up to the big leagues. Zach, they went out and got Zach short because they don't believe in David Flesher, clearly. And so he's like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to pitch. Uh, he's throwing knuckleballs in triple A. He threw five innings this week against the Norfolk Tides, the Orioles triple A team, who is like the greatest hitting minor league team basically ever. ever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And he struck out six guys in five innings, three hits, two runs, completely regular pitching line. And he struck out Jackson Holiday, which honestly, that's bad. That makes me sad that David Fletcher struck out Jackson Holiday with a knuckleball in AAA. That bums me out. Still, David Fletcher, just it's big Kenny Powers energy. Knuckleballs in AAA, under investigation, gambling ring. No notes. Absolutely love it. Just like making the most of it. His ability, his time, just making the most of it. He doesn't know how much longer he's got left. Right. I mean, he might right. be in, he might be next to Ipe in, uh, in the, uh, you know, in the prison softball team soon. So we gotta, we gotta keep him, uh, keep him pitching. Chelsea, what's bad for you this week besides, you know, prison? Um, right. Sure. Definitely. Uh, in some cases, um, I, I have a very specific, bad yeah which is you know we're in the era of the golden era i would say of home run celebrations i think and the reds have decided they're gonna go do theirs in the tunnel out of what sight so the reds they like ch chucked their viking helmet and now after every homer they like run down the tunnel and do something in the tunnel out of sight and i think that that is a bad call because the celebrations aren't for them they're for the cameras. They're for the kids. Like, if you're doing something shady, it just makes us wonder. I think you got to bring it in the dugout. I don't like it. I don't I don't want any part of it. I think they should change it. I want public celebrations or no celebrations. I don't, I don't want a mix of both here. Okay, so I'm now, I'm only learning about this now. Yes. So they hit a home run and the whole dugout runs into the tunnel? Yes. At least, like, it looks like all the position players and everyone that's in there, like, runs down the stairs like a little giddy horde of mice and it, it makes me nervous i don't know what they're doing is it is it kids safe i don't know how do you talk to your kids about this i don't know huh anyway this is very suspicious it, it is it is wow it makes me want to ask questions i shouldn't have questions about a home run celebration you know yeah the, what are you doing right and if you can't huh. share it why why you know you're calling attention to it I, I'm just, I'm sure it's fine, but I, it just makes me uncomfortable and I don't want to be uncomfortable with home run celebrations. I agree. There's this video. This is from a Will Benson home run. He hits the homer, he touches home and he just sprints straight down the tunnel and then everyone follows him. Right. Okay. Uh, my bad this week is Andrew Benintendi, who I dunked on already on Wednesday's show, but it turns out I did a little, little sniffing around. Andrew Benintendi is chasing history, Chelsea. Because Andrew Benintendi, according to the uh, website Fangraphs, a good website that I use quite often, Andrew Benintendi is going to challenge for one of the worst seasons of all time by negative war. The idea of being a negative war player cracks me up because if I put, you know, and the idea of wins above replacement is that you are better than the replacement level player, which is available to every team in theory. Right. Andrew Benatendi has been worth negative 1.7 fan graphs wins above replacement this year through just 49 games. Now, going that far in the red is very rare. It is very impressive. According to fan graphs, the all-time worst season, I'm going to do just the wild card era since 1993. Uh, Jose Guillen was worth negative 3.1 war in 1997. That is the only season ever to go 
past the negative three mark, 13 players have gone past the negative two mark most recently. No surprise here. Chris Davis in 2018 was worth negative 2.5. Andrew Benintendi, that I think is what he should be shooting for. Getting a 3.1 negative war feels a little bit out of reach. However, Chris Davis feels attainable. And I believe Benintendi will continue to get his opportunities because, as I mentioned, he is under contract for three more seasons at a, the largest contract in White Sox history. He's going to continue to get at bats and he is going to, unless his production changes, his performance changes, he's going to continue to tumble down this leaderboard. So I will keep an eye on that. That is literally bad. Chelsea Janes, one That's last thing. And then we'll say goodbye. Do you have anything on Ben Attendee? No, I was just going to say, like, you're making your presence felt. It's just not not the right way. That's true. Ugla. What is Ugla? You are someone who has spent time around Dan Ugla. You once came on our podcast and talked about Dan Ugla. You uh, understand the concept of Ugla more than I ever will. So what is Ugla this week in baseball? So you might have talked about this, but I, I opened the X app and I came across a tweet from TMZ this week that read Hayden Hopkins is says her child is with MLB star Joey Gallo not Mark Davis like let's break let's break this down so this Mark was a Davis surprise. who is Mark Davis who is Mark Davis? exactly he's the owner of the Oakland Raiders he has some of the strangest man bangs I think anyone has ever maybe literally in the history of like the modern world and he's yeah. old Hayden Hopkins, I didn't know who she was either. She's a dancer slash influencer. And then there's Joey Gallo, who, if you've been around Joey Gallo, really nice guy, pretty introverted, not somebody I expected to see in TMZ at all. And here he is in this headline. So I, apparently he is the father of Hayden Hopkins, an influencer's child, not, as you probably suspected, Mark Davis. And I just... Oh. It, you know, it was going to be one or the other, right? So, but I read that, I was like, this is, I mean, I can't think of someone more opposite than Joey Gallo. So I think they're, you know, they're, Joey's from Vegas, but I just, it was a stunning headline to read. And I think for anyone who's been around Joey Gallo, no shade, like hope everyone's happy and healthy, but just... I, I mean, if those are the two, you're in a really interesting spot, I think. It's fascinating. So what happened here, first of all, this is perfect. This is perfect, Ugly. Hayden Hopkins was, again, d did not know who she is. Same. Wish her nothing but the best. Totally. Hay Hayden Hopkins, a uh, very healthy pregnancy for you, Hayden Hopkins. Hayden Hopkins was at uh, a Raiders game sitting next to Mark Davis and was photographed. And so lazy online people, when she was pregnant, were like, well, it must have been this 69-year-old weird banged, you know, sports owning scion which first of all is quite a conclusion to draw from one picture i've been photographed next to many people none of whom are carrying any of my children i have to say however good, good to know just want to you know just for the record <laughs> just put that out there sure, sure. joey gallo just appearing in this story is great and everything seems good Hayden had some comment on her Instagram that said, Joey and I are, you know, the baby's healthy and we're very excited to welcome our child. Great. Fatherhood. No notes. But like, do I go up to Joey Allen in the clubhouse and say congratulations and, and glad it wasn't Mark Davis? Like, I mean, how do you even... I mean, it depends on your relationship with Joey Gallo. It, it depends on your relationship with Joey Gallo. Like, It's not. <laughs> I, yeah. Going up to Joey Gallo would be like, whew, I was worried that <laughs> Mark Davis was fathering this child thank god it's you yeah i i it's great and there must be some great banter on the team plane about this stuff yeah i guess if if i mean also but like most of the nationals are like 21 and probably haven't even heard of mark davis so it's it's wild it's wild they definitely haven't heard of hayden hopkins all health and love to the unborn child my ugly this week is a video a tiktok posted by a uh, media company named Bleacher Report. I believe people are familiar. Uh, it is an interview with Harrison Bader. Uh, behind the scenes, I actually saw this interview being done because it was done on the field of City Field while I was walking around. And I was like, oh, there's Harrison Bader wearing a, a crop top type shirt. As he does that. He does. He does do that. 
Now, the reason this is ugly is he is asked by the Bleacher Report interviewer person, um, who I believe is named Paige Mautner, who is your Mount Rushmore of New York athletes? Good question to a kid who has played for the Yankees and the Mets, who is from New York City. There are a couple different acceptable ways to answer this question, right? One would be to just say four Mets, right? You're on the Mets. Just go Piazza, LaDuca, Tom Seaver, Doc Gooden, whatever. Okay? LaDuca. Wow. LaDuca. <laughs> That's one. The other is you just do one Met and then you do like Mark Messier. You sure. do Walt Frazier. You do Eli Manning. You do Chad Pennington. You do whatever, right? Totally. It's another one. Aaron Rodgers. And Why not? Aaron Rodgers. Even Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers was a better answer than what he said. Okay. But what? Harrison Bader says is hilarious. He says, Derek Jeter, fine. Honestly, good answer. Derek Jeter is the right answer. And then he says, Aaron Judge and Anthony Volpe. <laughs> the Volpe yeah. one got me. <laughs> the Volpe one's amazing. Now, the reason, there are many reasons this is funny. One, someone tell bro he's on the Mets. Bro thinks he's on the team still. Harrison Bader, who very clearly, I believe, grew up a Yankees fan, when he there was like a clip of him leaving the Yankees where he was tearing up when they put him on waivers because that experience meant a lot to him. And I'm not trying to make light of that. That's really cool. He got to play for the Yankees. However, you got a beard now. You're on the Mets. OK, the beard, in fact, matches the color of the orange Mets logo on your hat. Right. We can't be saying three Yankees. And if you're saying three Yankees, let's just mix in a Met. OK, we can mix in one Met. If he had just said. If he had said Volpe, Judge, Jeter, Pete Alonzo, that would have been weird, but better than this. However, the biggest problem with this, Chelsea, is what? There's only three. There's only three. Mount Rushmore is four. He was not asked for his podium sure. of New York athletes. He was asked for his Mount Rushmore of New York athletes. And this raises the question that I will get to the bottom of. Does Harrison Bader think there are only three presidents on the actual Mount Rushmore? Okay. Does he believe that Teddy Roosevelt is not there? That is an important question that I must ask. I'm going to ask him for his Mount Rushmore of something else, you know, Mount Rushmore of fruits. And if he says banana, blueberry, and pear, then something is amiss here with Harrison Bader and his knowledge of Mount Rushmore. Yeah. I mean, he's probably not the only one, you know. I mean, he could have just been like Gary Keith Ron and, you know, me, me. like me, er, anyone. But yeah, it, it, I would say like no shade to Harrison Bader, because if he doesn't know there's four people on Mount Rushmore, he's not alone in Major League Baseball. But right. But uh, yeah, there's a lot, to, a lot to worry about there, I would say. What percentage of American born big leaguers, one, know the number of presidents on Mount Rushmore and two, could name them? Very low. Very low. I don't even want to guess. Chelsea James, thank you so much for joining us this week on Baseball Barbacast. Uh, what are you looking forward to this weekend uh, in the world of baseball? It's a great question. I'm, I'm going to be up at Camden Yards a bit, so check out some more Orioles baseball. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Nothing specific. Always just 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 ball, you know? Just a lot just of ball. ball. One thing I actually, sorry, I forgot to mention. I should have done this as, as my bad. Did you know that the uh, defending AL champions and defending NL champions played a World Series rematch this week? Yeah. No one cared. It was no. if a World Series rematch falls in the forest, does it make a sound? The Diamondbacks and Rangers played a three game set and both of those teams are blah right now. Yeah. And n there was no hype. No hype. I mean, zero. Zilch. They were kind of blah last year in October, too. Like, no offense. But yeah. Yeah. It was a uh, an October to forget. I mentioned this at the beginning of the of the show. Uh, college baseball D1 regionals are this weekend starting today. Highly recommend. Turn on Squeeze Play with friend of the show, Mike Rooney. If you like ball, even if you don't like college baseball, it is quad box to quint box to sexta box to however many boxes you need. It is so much endless baseball. There are 16 regionals going on at the same time different parts of the country. It is competitive. It is meaningful. It is high energy. It is great stuff. I am particularly excited to watch the um, Chapel Hill Regional 
where North Carolina is the one seed and LSU, the defending national champions, are the two seed. LSU is a very, very fun freshman that I want people to know about named Stephen Milam. Stephen Milam is like 5'8", 165, 170. An undersized infielder, you say, at LSU? Chelsea Janes, does this remind you of anybody? What if I told you that Stephen Milam is from Albuquerque, New Mexico? Whoa, no way. The same hometown of Alex Bregman. Stephen Milam grew up loving Alex Bregman, and now he is the second baseman. For the Tigers, he had a walk-off home run in the SEC tournament for LSU. And then this week, he dyed his hair black and purple with tiger stripes. Okay? That is what college baseball is all about. Chelsea Jades, before we go, is there anything you would like to promote or plug? No. The only thing I was going to say is no one who grew up watching Alex Bregman should be allowed. Allowed. It's too young. I can't have it. Too young? Can't have it. But no, nothing. I don't. I can't even honestly recommend that anyone follow me on Twitter because it's it's dark out there. But but yeah, thanks for asking. <laughs> Please uh, follow Chelsea on uh, on Twitter. You can find her at Chelsea Janes underscore. I don't know who the real Chelsea uh, Janes is, but they took the good one. I oh, know they took the good one. You can read her work at the Washington Post. Thank you to Chelsea for pinch hitting. For Jordan, I very much appreciate your time. Thank you to Andrew Hartz for producing. And thank you to David Fletcher for trying to continue. We'll talk to everybody on Monday. Have a great weekend.